Now, there's a, a few uh, secondary efficacy outcomes of interest. Rates of myocardial infarction were a little bit higher with both doses of dabigatran compared with warfarin, but uh, vascular mortality and all-cause mortality were, uh, were lower. So why is there more MI with dabigatran? Is this a chance finding? It's possible. It's a small increase, but it was seen with both dose regimens of dabigatran. Could it be that warfarin is superior to dabigatran for inhibition of clotting at sites of plaque disruption? We know that warfarin is very effective for secondary prevention after myocardial infarction, but nobody uses it because of the inconvenience. So it may be that multiple target inhibition is better to suppress explosive thrombosis at sites of plaque rupture compared to targeted inhibition with a stoichiometric inhibitor that may be overcome at the site where you get explosive thrombosis. And perhaps there are other factors. Now, one of the, the, the issues that killed uh, zymelagotran or Exanta, the, the uh, previous oral direct thrombin inhibitor was the potential for hepatotoxicity. And here you see in the RELY trial looking at uh, elevations of transaminases after randomization, no difference in the rate of transaminase increase with dabigatran compared with warfarin. Now, a lot was made at the FDA panel meeting about which dose for which patient. And let's quickly look at some of the subgroup analyses here. And if we look at stroke and systemic embolism by CHAD score category, the 0 to 1, the 2, or the 3 plus, you see that with regardless of CHAD score, the higher dose regimen produces a reduction in stroke or systemic embolism compared with warfarin, whereas the, the, the lower dose regimen gives you results similar to those with warfarin. If you look at major bleeding, again, the lower dose regimen, trend for <clears throat> less bleeding than compared with warfarin at all CHAD scores and with the higher dose regimen, uh, similar bleeding rates. Intracranial bleeding, regardless of CHAD score, regardless of dose regimen, lower with dabigatran than with warfarin. Now, what about the effect of, of age and creatinine clearance? This drug is 80% cleared by the kidney, so you'd expect as the creatinine clearance goes down that you could get accumulation and the propensity for more bleeding. I think what's interesting here is that uh, regardless of age, even for those over 75, and regardless of creatinine clearance, uh, similar efficacy results with with, with the, the, to warfarin with the low dose, and a, a trend for better efficacy with the, with the high dose regimen. Hemorrhagic stroke uh, reduced in all age groups with all levels of creatinine clearance. Uh, major bleeding is interesting because age trumps creatinine clearance as a, as a risk factor, and you see here that as you get to be 75 or older, the advantage of the lower dose regimen for redu reduction in major bleeding disappears, and there's actually a trend for a little bit more bleeding with a high dose regimen compared with warfarin. So it'll be interesting to see whether the FDA, one, whether they approve the drug, and two, whether they approve both doses or whether they only approve the 150 milligram dose because it looks like the best dose uh, in terms of efficacy and safety. Now, what about other indications? The RECOVER trial done by, led by Sam Schulman at uh, McMaster University, patients with objectively confirmed v venous thromboembolism were given an initial course of a heparin and then randomized to dabigatran, 150 milligrams twice a day, or warfarin, dose adjusted to an INR of two to three for six months. Here are the major results. The major efficacy endpoint was recurrent venous thromboembolism and venous thromboembolism-related mortality. Similar results with both regimens. 
and the major bleeding rate, a trend for less major bleeding with dabigatran, but not significant. But if you add up major plus clinically relevant non-major, significantly less bleeding with uh, dabigatran. So a non-inferiority result that suggests that dabigatran has efficacy and safety similar to that of, uh, of warfarin for treatment of established venous thromboembolism. So is warfarin obsolete? Are we going to uh, get rid of it because these new agents are more convenient? It's important to note that warfarin is very effective when the time and therapeutic range is high. This is shown very nicely in the active A trial where patients were randomized to warfarin or to dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and clopidogrel. And if you look at the reduction in thrombotic endpoints in people who had a time and therapeutic range over 65 which was, uh, percent, which was the median in the study, and less than 65 percent, you see that the big advantage of warfarin over dual antiplatelet therapy in those occurs in those who have time and therapeutic range that's high. If the time and therapeutic range goes lower, then dual antiplatelet therapy and warfarin have similar efficacy. The time and therapeutic range in the RELY trial was 64% overall, higher in those who were uh, warfarin experienced than in those who were warfarin naive. But if you look at the results as a function of country, it's interesting that in, for example, countries where, uh, like Western Europe, where INR management is excellent, you see that the results with, uh, with uh, dabigatran are very similar, even the high dose dabigatran, very similar to those uh, with warfarin, where if you look at South Asia, where INR control is, is notoriously poor, you see the huge advantage of uh, dabigatran over warfarin. So the biggest threat to these new agents is well-controlled warfarin. And if we could get the time and therapeutic range in the 75 to 80 percent range in all of our patients, we probably would not need these new agents or the need for them would be less pressing. Who's not a candidate for dabigatran or for these new agents? Well, I think someone who's stable on warfarin and doing well and happy with that drug, why would you switch with the data that I've just shown you? And remember that patients with renal impairment, creatinine clearance less than 30 mLs per minute, severe hepatic disease, were excluded from all of these trials, and they're not going to be candidates for any of these new drugs. And perhaps the person who forgets to take the, the drug here and there the long half-life of warfarin, that probably doesn't matter, but the shorter half-life of these agents, it might matter much more. So what are some of the unanswered questions? Will elimination of monitoring adversely impact patient care? So if we don't monitor, we don't need to monitor these agents to change the dose, but how will we know that the patients are taking the medication? Will the short half-life obviate the need for an antidote? Sure, we can wait it out the way that Dr. Bott said with the antiplatelet agents, but sometimes you can't wait. You really need to reverse quickly. There is no easy way to do that. And how are, are we going to manage the patients with a history of cardi cardiac disease or GI bleeding with dabigatran? Those are going to be issues we'll have to face. It may not be an issue for the 10A inhibitors. We don't know yet. So where are we with the other agents, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and adoxaban? These agents are in advanced phase three uh, evaluation for atrial fibrillation and for venous thromboembolism. We heard the results of the, of the Einstein uh, DVT trial just a few weeks ago before I submitted these slides. But again, it looks like uh, Rivaroxaban is non-inferior to conventional anticoagulation for the treatment of patients with deep vein thrombosis. We don't yet have the results in patients with pulmonary embolism. So we've got some challenges with these new agents. The costs are going to be high. In Canada, warfarin costs 12 cents a day. These agents aren't going to cost 12 cents a day. They're likely uh, going to be in the 3 to $4 range per, for daily treatment, uh, at least in, in Canada. 
Right now, uh, River Oxaban costs about $9.50 a day. It's priced on par with low molecular weight heparin to be competitive in the orthopedic setting. The cost, I'm sure, will come down uh, with, uh, once these drugs are approved for long-term indications. The cost of, of Debigatran is very similar to the cost of River Oxaban. How are we going to assess compliance? How are we going to know whether the patients are taking their medicines without some sort of monitor, monitoring? And how are we going to treat the bleeds? So in conclusion, the results with dabigatran and more recently with rivaroxaban compared with warfarin are promising. The dosing of the new anticoagulant is going to be critical. They got it just right and rely. Are the doses of the factor 10A inhibitors where with Aristotle and with uh, the rocket AF trials, these are one dose, so you don't have two kicks at the can. Are they going to be right? And I think without a doubt, as these new agents come to market, they're going to replace warfarin. But I think the transition is going to be slower than uh, some people may think because we've had a lot of experience with warfarin. The cost of these agents are going to be high, and there are lots of things to sort out. And I'll stop there. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you.